Hello and welcome back. We are on chapter 15 of Materials Kinetics, uh, which is Advanced Nucleation Theories. Uh, last time in chapter 14, we studied classical nucleation theory, um, which was good in that it provided a lot of insights into some of the basics of nucleation and then crystal growth. Um, but it did make a lot of simplifying assumptions. Uh, and so we want to revisit some of those assumptions and see what what are some possibilities to go beyond that? Um, so the outline for today is that we're, we're going to cover four different types of advanced nu nucleation theories. Uh, the first one is based on statistical mechanical treatment of cluster formation. Uh, the second is based on diffuse interface theory, then density functional theory. No, it's not what you think. It's a different type of density functional theory. And then the implicit glass model. Um, so let's start, though, with some motivation for why we would want to go beyond classical nucleation theory. Recall that um, one of the main assumptions there is that the nucleus has a spherical shape. Um, you know, it's always easier from a physics perspective to assume that something is a sphere, but that doesn't mean that it is a sphere. Uh, and in fact, nucleating clusters can be highly non-spherical in some cases. Uh, classical nucleation theory also assumes that there is a sharp, well-defined interface between the nucleating cluster and the liquid matrix. Uh, in reality, that boundary may not be so well-defined. It may be more of a diffuse interface between the two. Uh, classical nucleation theory also assumes that the critical work of forming a nucleus is based on just a simple trade-off between um, the, the free energy penalty associated with the interface formation and then the benefit to free energy that comes from the volumetric free energy terms. That might be overly simplistic as well. And finally, um, classical nucleation theory doesn't consider any metastable phases that might evolve um, on the path towards uh, nucleation. So for example, you might have say liquid liquid phase separation that occurs and then the interfaces uh, then serve as sites for heterogeneous nucleation. And that's something that is simply not considered in classical theory. Um, so this shows an example of some calculated nucleating clusters here. Uh, on the left, this is lithium metasilicate. On the right, lithium disilicate. And then going across the rows, it's a different number of formula units in the clusters. Uh, this first row shows two formula units in the cluster, and then four, six, eight, and so on. And you can see that these shapes are, um, you know, some of them are kind of spherical, not really, but a little bit. But others are, are quite different from a spherical shape. Um, and so this assumption of a spherical nucleus isn't necessarily a good one. Uh, and in fact, if we compare the shapes of these nucleating clusters to uh, electron micrographs of nucleating clusters for the same system, this is for lithium metasilicate, you can see that the, um, you know, the experimental shapes are much more in line with these simulation shapes and being uh, rather non-spherical. So some of the shortcomings of the classical nucleation theory uh, also include some rather major quantitative discrepancies between what's predicted from classical nucleation theory and um, the actual measured nucleation rates. These are some extreme cases that have been noted by uh, my good friend in the field, Professor Edgar Zanotto from F Federal University of Sao Carlos in Brazil. And uh, you can see for these systems here, barium disilicate, lithium disilicate, sodalime silicate, it's many, many orders of magnitude off. And so you know, the, the quantitative predictions can be um, you know, well off, orders of magnitude off compared to the actual data. So the question that we want to try to answer here is how can we improve upon classical nucleation theory? Uh, let's start with what's probably the most complicated approach um, the most versatile, uh, but the most difficult to implement, which would be a, a complete statistical mechanical description of cluster formation leading to nucleation. Um, and this is a way to try to get at the work of cluster formation. 
Um, statistically, stati in the framework of statistical mechanics, this would be formulated using the grand canonical partition function um, because the grand canonical partition function can change the uh, number of particles in the system. In this case, what we're doing is trying to calculate the grand canonical partic partition function, which is constant volume, constant temperature, and constant chemical potential by summing up over uh, different cluster sizes. And so the summation here is uh, over a different number of molecules, uh, where for each one of those, we can have the canonical partition function defined. So this Q would be for a given size N and then constant volume and constant T, you know, what would be the partition function in that case. And this partition function then is calculated by integrating over the Boltzmann probability factor, um, where the H here is the Hamiltonian, that is the, the entire uh, all contributions to the energy of the system, potential energy and kinetic energy that defines the probabilities of, of different types of molecules existing or clusters existing in the system. And then all of that gets uh, you know, compiled into these uh, partition functions for each size. We sum up over all of them and that gives us the grand canonical partition function. Now, the real key piece here is to try to capture some of the um, the energetics of the interactions that occur within clusters. And the formulation here is uh, assuming that there's some energetics associated with particle interactions within clusters, but it ignores um, interactions between clusters. So it's ignoring cluster-cluster interactions. Um, this omega term here, omega raised, or not raised to the power, but omega with a superscript of N indicates some intra-cluster interaction energy for a cluster of size little n. So for summing up over uh, clusters of different sizes here, um, you know, one body cluster, two body, three body, four body, and so on, all those interaction energies would be incorporated into that term. Uh, the common term here would be the baseline energy, uh, omega uh, zero, which would be for the, uh, the zero uh, size of the cluster. And so this gets summed up over all the, uh, the various uh, sizes of clusters with the energetics incorporating there. And we can take this part of it and lump all of that together to represent uh, the grand canonical partition function in terms of this common prefactor out in front. And then E, this exponential here, is here, uh, with a summation over all the cluster sizes, where um, everything that's not this um, E to the chemical potential N over KT gets lumped together into this cluster partition function. So this cluster partition function Z sub N uh, is what gives us the partition function for that cluster of that particular size. Then, uh, because this is a constant volume system, we can calculate the Helmholtz free energy of the cluster of size n, this f of n here, uh, by taking the logarithm of that partition function, that cluster partition function, and multiplying by minus kT, minus Boltzmann's constant times temperature, and that will give you the free energy that is associated with um, that particular cluster. Um, then what we want to do is compare that free energy to the free energy uh, in the absence of the cluster. So the free energy of just the matrix phase, which would be uh, what if um, those N atoms were in the matrix phase that has a chemical potential of mu. In that case, the free energy that gets compared is just N times mu. Um, and so what is the free energy difference between having the atoms in the nucleating cluster versus having the same atoms in the matrix phase? That gives us this free energy difference here, this delta F. And um, then the ensemble uh, uh, of the, this, the ensemble average of the number of clusters is uh, going to be related, related to the Boltzmann statistics of that free energy difference. Um, we can also use this to calculate the probability of having a cluster of size little n. So in this case, the numerator here is the expectation value of the number of clusters of size little n. And if we take that expectation value and divide by the total number of, of those clusters, um, then you've got the probability of having a cluster of that particular size. And then the corresponding work of cluster formation is just minus kT times the natural log of that probability. Um, now, this is, has a lot of details that need to be provided. 
especially related to all the energetics that are associated with um, the clusters of different sizes. So, um, you know, a good thing about the statistical mechanical approach is that it's very uh, general, very broad. Um, but the bad thing is that it, it leaves a lot of details unspecified. So the formulation can be modified to describe nucleation in various systems of interest. The key is to have an accurate model for the interaction energies within a nucleating cluster and within the original matrix phase. If, if that's not accurate, then everything else that's, that gets calculated is also not accurate. Uh, also, cluster-cluster interactions have been ignored here. If the density of the clusters is high, then that would need to be included. And overall, while statistical mechanics provides a powerful approach for modeling nucleation behavior, it's not necessarily the most practical way to solve the problem. It's, it's actually very difficult to implement those equations, and I don't think it has been done in a practical case. And that's especially uh, complicated for complex multi-component systems. So as an alternative, um, the next two approaches that we're going to study, diffuse interface theory and density functional theory, provide more of an intermediate level description between classical nucleation theory and um, this kind of full throttled um, statistical mechanical approach. So let's go next to diffuse interface theory. This is like the next logical step after classical uh, nucleation theory, uh, where we relax this assumption of having a completely sharp interface. So with diffuse interface theory, we can account for having some width of the interface between the nucleating cluster phase and the matrix phase. Um, and this is something that is simply not handled within classical nucleation theory. So the name should be obvious now why it's called a diffuse interface theory, because it can account for a diffuse rather than a sharp interface between the nucleating cluster and the matrix phase. So we're still going to assume that the nucleus is spherical, but we're going to assume that it is spherical with um, an interface that has some breadth to it. And the key is that we're going to define um, some free energy density, so free energy per unit volume, that is a function of distance r from the center of your nucleating cluster. So r equals zero would be the center of your nucleating cluster. And as you go outward from r equals zero, uh, initially you're within that nucleating cluster, and that would give you the solid uh, free energy density, g sub s. Then it's going to encounter the interface. It has to go through this interface, and there's a free energy penalty associated with that interface because that's where you've got the greatest mismatch of bonding between um, you know, the nucleating crystal and the disordered liquid. So the free energy density goes up. It goes through a peak in the interface, and then it comes back down to give you the liquid state free energy density, which is labeled as G sub L. And since we are at a temperature that is below the melting point, we know that the nucleating crystal has a lower free energy compared to the liquid. So that's why the GL is higher compared to the GS. But the greatest free energy density is at the interface itself because that is the least favorable structure of the material. But once we define this uh, G of R function, then we can calculate the uh, work of formation of a cluster, uh, W of R, uh, by simply integrating that function uh, radially. So it's the integral from zero to infinity of our G of R uh, function minus the GL. So basically what is the free energy change of having the nucleating cluster versus just having the free energy of the matrix liquid phase itself. So G of R minus GL, and we're integrating radially. So we multiply this by the surface area of the sphere as we go out. It's four pi r squared, and then integrate over r. And if you get that, that will give you this uh, work of formation of our cluster for that particular size. Now, the next step is analogous to what we did in classical nucleation theory. We need to calculate the critical cluster radius um, for a, the nucleus to be stable. So this, we need to calculate the r star, where if the nucleus is greater than r star in width, then, or in radius, then it will be stable. If the nucleus is less than r star, then it would be unstable and shrink. So we do that by taking the derivative of this work of formation with respect to r and setting that equal to zero. 
Um, and when we solve for that, then that would give us the R star. And if we take that R star, put it back into our original uh, work function, that would give us the thermodynamic barrier for nucleation. So if we are given a functional form for G of R, the problem would be solved. As you can guess, the difficulty is getting that functional form for G of R because this is kind of a phenomenological model and it doesn't provide the pathway for actually getting that G of R function. So diffuse interface theory is um, nice in that it is a simple extension of classical nucleation theory and it shows how you can account for continuous variations of free energy across an interface. However, it is an ad hoc theory resting on unproven assumptions, and it doesn't give you the means to calculate that G of R function. So the next theory that we're going to consider is density functional theory. This is not the density functional theory from quantum mechanics that dealt with electron density. This is a classical theory that um, assumes that the free energy, uh, the local free energy of a, a region in the material is a functional of the density. So this is just the, the regular um, mass density of, of the material in a classical sense. Um, it is called density functional theory because the free energy is a function of the density, which is a function of the position. And a function of a function is called a functional. So this DFT allows for a more formal treatment of nucleation that's intermediate between the macroscopic thermodynamic description of classical nucleation theory and the more microscopic based computer simulation methods. The basic formalism of DFT um, considers a spatially inhomogeneous density that underline, underlies the thermodynamic treatment of nucleation. It is assuming that the free energy is entirely governed by density differences. So in other words, the nucleating cluster is likely to have a higher density since it has a more ordered structure compared to the liquid state, which is more disordered. But it's assuming that all of the changes of the free energy can be expressed in terms of density differences. Since the density varies continuously through the interface, between the cluster and the original phase, it can be taken as an order parameter for a DFT description of the phase transition. And then the free energy is then expressed as a functional of the density. So how do we formulate this? Um, if the free energy is a functional of the density, then it can be calculated by integrating the free energy density over the full volume of the system. So in other words, this free energy density here, little g, this is a functional of the density, which is a function of the position here, r. And if we integrate that over the entire volume of the system, the integral of this would give us the total free energy of the system as a functional of the density. Now, what do we do? We need to calculate the work of cluster formation by taking the difference between the free energy of the system, including the cluster, which is this G of rho here, um, compared to the free energy of the matrix phase without having the cluster. And that is this N times mu. So mu here is the chemical potential of the matrix phase. Uh, N would be the number of molecules. So if the N molecules or N atoms are in the matrix phase, the uh, free energy associated with that is N times mu. If they are in the um, cluster phase of the nucleating crystal, then it's this G of rho function. So the difference here gives us the work of formation of um, that particular uh, cluster of that, that size N. Now this W of rho, this work then can be expressed as the integral over all the volume of the system. And then we've got here the Gibbs free energy, um, including the nucleating cluster, minus then this Gibbs free energy of the matrix phase. And so the difference here between the two is what's going to give us the work. The next step is to find 
um, a critical fluctuation in the density that leads to stable nucleus formation. This is analogous to what we did in classical nucleation theory and diffuse interface theory, where we um, figured out what the critical value of the um, nucleus radius is, the R star, that led to stable nucleus formation. The difference is now, instead of expressing this in terms of, of forming a nucleus of a certain radius, we're expressing it in terms of having a fluctuation that reaches a certain critical density. And that critical density, rho star, is defined to be the density that would enable a stable formation of the nucleus. So what we're going to do is, um, again, to see uh, where this work of formation, um, how that derivative with respect to our order parameter here, the density, so how the change of the how much the work is changing with respect to the density change, where that equals zero, that corresponds to the rho equals rho star. So just like where we had um, you know, the derivative of the work uh, with respect to r equals zero defines the r star, the same thing is here, but with respect to the density, and that's what defines the critical density here, rho star. So this actually defines a variational condition for nucleation, and it's going to use the same uh, mathematics that we used in deriving the kahn hilliard equation back in the chapter on phase separation. Um, so there, remember what we did is to take uh, a variational derivative um, because we had a functional there as well, just as we have here. This work is a functional of the density, and we want to know how that is varying with respect to changes in that function. Um, and so we're going to use the same type of mathematics here, uh, where now we have uh, defined, uh, basically using our calculus of variations, that this um, work here can be expressed in terms of this integral, and we want it to set that equal to zero. This contains the contributions uh, due to, this is the free energy difference between the system with the nucleating cluster and then the matrix phase without. So how, so this is that contribution, and then the contributions that are due to the changes of the density with respect to the position itself. So this is kind of a, a, a gradient term, if you will. And where this equals zero, this corresponds to the critical uh, density rho star. One way for this integral to be equal to zero is if the integrand is equal to zero, which forms this Euler-Lagrange equation here. If you set the integrand equal to zero, um, this would equal zero at rho equals rho star. So if we set that equal to zero, um, and work this out, this can actually reduce down to um, you know, where is the chemical potential in the nucleating cluster phase equal to the chemical potential in the matrix phase. That's where you, you've got some um, condition of stability of that nuclei, nucleating phase, and that corresponds to the rho equals rho star. Um, so this is becoming mathematically rather complicated. And um, the question is, can we actually solve this equation or not? It can be solved uh, subject to appropriate boundary conditions to obtain the critical de density rho zero. Um, whether you would want to do that solution analytically or numerically, or whether that solution makes sense is another question. Uh, but this is, as I noted, equivalent to um, having an equilibration of these um, chemical potential. So basically a mu star equals mu, that would correspond to this case here of rho equals rho star. Then once we determine that rho star, the next step is to take that critical density fluctuation and stick it back into our work function. And if you stick that into the work function and solve this integral, that would then give you um, the Gibbs free energy that's associated uh, with forming that uh, that nucleus uh, with that critical uh, density fluctuation rho star. So that gives you the work of forming the nucleus uh, with that particular critical density. Um, so, you know, it's kind of analogous to what we did before, but every place where we had an R star, now we have a rho star. Um, and the mathematics, of course, gets a lot more complicated because now we're using variational calculus as opposed to, um, you know, just using simple integrals as we did before.
So it is analogous to classical nucleation theory, but with a, a much more mathematically elaborate, elaborate formalism. Kind of a, a critical evaluation here of density functional theory is that you know the main assumption here is that everything is driven by the density. Any change of free energy is entirely driven by changes in density and nothing else. And that um, you know maybe it works fine for some systems, but it's clearly an oversimplification, um, especially if you've got you know other changes to the chemistry or the structure that could give different free energy densities with equivalent densities or if you have a case where a liquid and a crystal have the same density then there's no way to uh, model that at all using dft uh, moreover the order parameter here the density uh, this is could also be changing as a function of time and in addition to position uh, these predictions from dft calculations of nucleation depend on all these details and the related approximations and the results um, you know, generally agree that the interfaces between clusters of the new phase and the original phase are diffuse rather than sharp, which is good. Um, and this leads to a different uh, work of cluster formation and different critical size compared to classical nucleation theory. So there's the issue of, you know, disagreements among the models themselves. So DFT, it's, it's certainly a really interesting idea, um, but it's not something that one would kind of casually go and implement to, um, to model nucleation behavior. And in case you're sensing a pattern here, there's a reason why people still use classical nucleation theory. Despite all of its flaws, it is by far the easiest to understand conceptually and also the easiest to implement. Uh, but let me give you one more approach, and this is a numerical approach. It's called the implicit glass model. And this was uh, developed by uh, my friend here, Matt McKenzie and myself. Most of the credit goes to Matt for this, and it is a hybrid Monte Carlo approach for calculating crystal nucleation that um, kind of it builds upon that statistical mechanical description in terms of using a grand canonical partition function, but where we are solving for the energetics using Monte Carlo, so we're solving it numerically. And the other key is that uh, we're using a continuous uh, salvation model. So um, we only do the atomic scale simulations for the nucleating cluster itself. And the matrix phase, the matrix liquid or glassy phase, is assumed to be a continuum. And then we make approximations for um, how the nucleating cluster interacts with that continuum. So continuum salvation is a, a standard approach, and we're adopting that as part of this uh, implicit glass model, the implicit solvent approach, or um, you know, continuum salvation here, uh, approximates the behavior of an explicit solvent using an effective uh, continuous medium. So to create the implicit glass model, we have effective born radii here, AI, that are used to calculate the salvation energy per atom in the cluster which is given by this formula here. So what we're doing is we're having an explicit atomic description of the nucleating cluster and considering that it's a, it's interacting with the solvent, the continuous solvent in an effective manner that's given by the salvation free energy. And this is in terms of these uh, Coulombic interactions that have appropriate screening that depend on um, interatomic separation distances and the dielectric behavior of the solvent itself. So this gives an, an effective um, average interaction with the solvent as a whole. And the grand canonical part comes in that we can systematically go through and vary the cluster size. This is the slide that I showed earlier where we have lithium metasilicate on the left, lithium disilicate on the right, the top row is two formula units of either lithium metasilicate or disilicate, and four formula units, six, and so on. And then the Monte Carlo simulation is used to optimize um, the structure of each cluster of each size by minimizing its free energy. And running Monte Carlo, then you get the minimum free energy um, cluster um, formation, and then you can calculate what the free energy is 
of that cluster and see how the free energy scales as a function of cluster size and see then where it goes through that maximum to get to the critical cluster size. And this is using you know, the actual calculated structures of the clusters with the actual calculated free energies, which as I showed before, um, you know, at least the morphology of these clusters seems to be in good agreement with, with what is observed experimentally. So there are, um, you know, a number of advantages to this approach, uh, although there's still a lot of work that is involved in implementing it. Um, so each step of the nu nucleating process can be simulated directly by systematically um, increasing the cluster size and seeing what those um, shapes are, what the, the optimum configurations of the clusters are. There's also significant computational savings obtained by treating um, the liquid or the glass matrix as an implicit solvent. So the only reason that this works effectively is because um, we can accelerate the simulations by having that assumption of a continuous um, solvent. And uh, this implicit solvent approach enables then the grand canonical Monte Carlo method to work efficiently even in a condensed system. We can also obtain the detailed atomic structure without any assumptions regarding the shape of the nuclei. Um, but this is dependent upon having accurate interatomic potentials for the systems. They exist for some systems and not for others. And there's also still a lot of cal calculations involved. So it still takes you know, quite a bit of computational work to go through all the different um, possible clusters and cluster sizes and to do all these free energy calculations. Uh, but still, it's a really promising approach that has been successfully applied to a couple of systems at this um, point and could be used for others as well. So to summarize, uh, you know, classical nucleation theory is used because it's simple and because it gives some nice physical insights. Um, there are some questionable assumptions uh, in classical nucleation theory. And so four of the various approaches to go beyond that would be a full-blown statistical mechanical approach, which could in principle be a lot more accurate for calculating the work of cluster formation, but leaves uh, a lot of unknowns that would need to be determined. Um, diffuse interface theory is um, kind of the next logical step here that uh, relaxes that ass assumption of a sharp interface to allow for um, a continuously varying free energy density across the interface, but it doesn't provide a means of defining what that function is. Uh, DFT, density functional theory, is um, considerably more complicated mathematically because of its use of variational calculus and um, it rests upon a questionable assumption that the free energy is only a function of density. Um, but it does offer an interesting approach that kind of parallels what we did with the kahn hilliard equation with phase separation. And then on the numerical side, the simplistic glass model uh, allows for a, an atomic scale of description of the nucleating clusters using an implicit solvent approach. So thank you very much for listening. And next time we will go into the viscosity of liquids. See you then.